All set? Okay. Call the meeting to order. Please take the roll. Call in the roll, Mr. Schron. Here. Mr. Tuma? Here. Mr. Hauser? Here. Ms. Baker? Here. Ms. Simon? Here. We have a quorum. Also like the record to reflect that Council Member Miller is also in attendance. Great. Is there any public comment in regards to the uh, for the meeting? No, no one has signed in. Okay, we'll move along. Uh, we have uh, minutes from the September 17th meeting. Has everybody had a chance to review those minutes? Uh, the chair will move. Is there a second to adopt? Uh, is there any discussion in regards to the September 17th meeting? Hearing no discussion, uh, call a vote. All in favor of approval of the minutes from the September 17th, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the minutes have been approved. Uh, the chair, at its discretion, is going to reorient the, uh, uh, the, the schedule as far as the items for discussion. I'm going to take the uh, item 5B first. If we could read 5B, please, into the record. Resolution number 2018-0197, determining the services and programs that shall be provided and funded from the Veterans Services Fund in 2018 authorizing payments to various providers in the total amount of $367,128 for said services and programs for the period ending 12-31-2018. And just for purpose of the record, this is a council-initiated uh, item, and so uh, rather than coming from uh, the county executive, this is initiated by the council itself, and so we do have a council person ready to speak on this. Ms. King? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Michael King, council staff. Uh, as you know, this is the annual Veteran Service Fund Award resolution coming before you today. Um, the, as you know, the Veteran Service Fund was established by Council in 2012 to provide supplemental support for organizations serving veterans within Cuyahoga County. The revenue for the fund is derived from the unspent, unspent cash balance of the Veteran Service Commission from the prior year. So over the past five years, this number has varied somewhere between $39,000 to uh, $750,000. This year's available balance is about $367,000. And since the program's inception, the county has contributed nearly $2 million to veteran service programs throughout the county. This year, uh, once again, the council staff informally solicited proposals from organizations in the community serving veterans. Uh, we did not solicit proposals from public entities. And if you look on uh, the spreadsheet provided, uh, the public entities are those listed in blue. Um, this resolution before you today reflects council staff's recommendations for 2019 awards based upon the proposals we received. Uh, ultimately, council has the opportunity to allocate these awards, awards as it sees fit. Uh, however, we simply ask that if there's an interest in making changes, staff have an opportunity to work with you to put together an updated set of recommendations. Uh, the spreadsheet you have in front of you shows the current recommendations. You can see under 2018 recommendations as well as past funding so you can compare to previous years. Uh, since all of the organizations that are receiving funding this year have received funding in the past, I'm not going to go into uh, the details unless there, unless there are specific questions about particular recipients. Uh, the one item I'd like to call to your attention, however, is the $75,000 for the uh, Cuyahoga Common Pleas Court Veterans Docket. Um, just to explain that one, since uh, we haven't funded that in a few years. That, that one, as you can see in 2015, council awarded some startup funding for the court. They then applied for and received a three-year federal grant to, to fund the uh, Veterans Treatment Court. That grant funding recently ran out, but they've also applied for and received a five-year grant that's going to start next year. The $75,000 is to make up basically four months of gap funding between those two federal grants. So since we had the funding available this year and that was a request that we had received, we thought this would be a, an appropriate use of those funds. So with that, I'd take any questions. Um, uh, questions from members of the committee? Yes, Mr. Uh, just a quick question, Michael. Can you explain the drop off from 50,000 to 15,000 for the land bank for housing assistance? Sure, so the, the land bank actually, that was something um, in the first year of the program, uh, we, we gave them $100,000 to do supportive housing um, for veterans. And um, initially the concept was that they'd leverage some additional dollars, which they did, I believe, somewhere in the range of like $40,000. They put in some, some of their own money. Um, at the time, uh, or last year, we got a report from them about a, lot, a number of their activities uh, and uh, decided, because last year we had some uh, additional funds available as compared to previous years, that we, did, that we would recommend uh, allocating $50,000 to support that program. Um, the drop really reflects, I think, um, 
the reduction in the, the overall amount. Um, and because unlike some of the other, we require most of these organizations to submit a budget, unlike some of the other organizations where they'll dedicate an FTE to a particular program, the land bank support is a little more flexible in that you know the funding uh, that they receive can go towards a, uh, sort of a, a host of different initiatives. And so um, it was less of a hit, I guess, for them to, to be dropped by that amount, so. Other questions? Yes. yes. Mr. Miller? Uh, why did we transition from funding both Tri-C and CSU to funding just Tri-C starting in 2017? So uh, as you recall, may recall from last year, CSU actually had some technical issues spending their award from 2016. Um, and we... Uh, we had requested that they, or in the last resolution, in 20, the 2017 resolution, we authorize, authorize them to use those $2016 and spend those down in 2017. They've had some turnover, and we, we, we didn't get the reporting that we had initially requested. Uh, but we've recently been put in touch with their new manager of their veterans uh, scholarship and hope to bring them back into the program in future years. And uh, can you explain the impact of... Uh, Changing the OHS dash MHS line from eighty five thousand to eighteen thousand. Yes. Yeah, so, um, as you know, the office. The, so, the Office of Homeless Services, and this is a little bit of a legacy information here. The awards to the Office of Homeless Services are instead of to MHS and Eden. They're basically now since two thousand sixteen. We've basically just allocated money to the Office of Homeless Services rather than individual contractors. It's up to them to decide where the appropriate service level needs are. Um, the reduction this year uh, was made in context of the concerted effort to increase funding for the county's homeless services in the last budget cycle. As you know, there, were, there was a significant increase in, in support. Um, we're going to continue to monitor this, but uh, we believe if the, the Office of Homeless Services can meet those existing needs with the additional funding, um, but we can always, of course, make budgetary adjustments if new circumstances arise. I have a question. Yes, Ms. Simon? So the Cliffy Municipal Courts Veterans Docket originally had a large allocation in 13 and nothing since. Or what's going on with them? Uh, they had reached out to us, I believe, in 2013, um, seeking funding. And in the, in the past, since that initial allocation, they've really not... We haven't heard anything from them. Um, okay. I, I don't know. I don't recall the context in which that was made, if it was a one-time type of contribution or if there were other factors involved. But we can look into that. You know, we should probably get some kind of um, update on the specialized court allocations. It's Maybe that's through Councilman Gallagher's committee so we can see exactly the impact that the courts are having. I mean, municipal court versus common pleas and, and how that's shaking out. But that's just the future. Yeah. I can say um, in, the, in the request from the Common Pleas Court, they've said that over the last three years with the federal grant they received, they've been able to bring, I think it was about 170 veterans into the program. So um, over the course of that time, they've been able to serve a good number of veterans. Anyway. Yeah, it probably overlaps with the treatment from drug court, too, I would think. There's probably some overlapping, but... The probably, yeah. Probably. Um, yes, Ms. Yes, Ms. Baker? I'm um, just curious on the Veterans 211. Um, it's a consistent, except for the first couple of years, of 65, 70, and 70, where it looks like they may be becoming dependent on this on these funds. Is that um, is that something that we've thought about in case we do drop back down from the 300,000 down to 100 or less? That some of these um, organizations that are consistent in their ask may have programs that they've been able to expand but may feel a loss of funds if we're not able to continue with the funding sure and and great question that's that's something that you know we've had um over the years we remind all of the recipients that this funding is contingent upon available resources and so they're i mean we, we do our best to set that expectation every every time we go through this process we've been fortunate over the the course of this program so far to be able to provide some base funding for some of the organizations that have done a really stellar job. And I think 211 is one of those programs. I think in terms of what we've heard back from not only our Veteran Service Commission, but also other 
stakeholders, two on ones, really the the hub through which a lot of these other services get referrals, right? Because they, you know, people call two one one and then they they direct them in the in the right way to go. So two one one is, I mean, I, your point is very well taken, and it's something we're we're mindful of. But um, but they're 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 one of the very very solid providers that we've consistently funded since the start of the program. Thank you, Mr. Miller. The forty thousand dollars for Joseph's home is that for construction or for operations? So Joseph's home, um, the forty thousand dollars is for operations. Um, every year, Joseph's home, uh, I believe, has a has a shortfall. They receive funding from HUD to provide um, uh, transitional housing for veterans in need. And um, I believe over, I believe this year their their uh, their shortfall from from federal um, funding was somewhere in the range of one hundred and thirty thousand um, dollars. Historically, you know th that shortfall has been beyond what the county's been able to make up. But we've tried to, over the course of the the years, um, do what we can to to, to help that narrow gap. the gap. Exactly. Okay, fine. Thank you. Others, um, just so that the public is aware, uh, and sometimes this gets lost in uh, in the process of government, that we are the only county in all 88 counties in the state of Ohio that does not take these funds and roll them back into the general fund. These were funds that were intended for veterans, and we as a county decided years ago that that's where they should stay. They should be in the best interest of the veterans. And I see Mr. Deshant back there uh, nodding his head. Uh, do what you can to try to encourage our, our, uh, our fellow county commissioners uh, uh, and uh, fellow folks down in Summit County that they too could be doing this very easily and uh, uh, it would be putting the money back where it belongs, which is my belief as a, as a veteran it belongs back with a veteran purpose out there. Now, by the same token to Ms. Baker on that, it is not our desire to even have this take place. Uh, it is our desire that 100% of these funds get used by the Veteran Service Commission so that they don't uh, necessarily have to come here. If they do, we're, we've already made a determination, but uh, it is not, uh, as Ms. Ms. Baker said, there might be a, a month or maybe a year in which the Veteran Service Commission has fully consumed these for veterans' purposes, and in which case we do not want anybody being so dependent upon this. This is supposed to be giving them that extra charge that can help them do something they, that they could not be. How, do, how are groups made aware of this? Obviously, the groups in the past uh, have, have gotten used to it, but how do we know there's not a, a group uh, every bit as big as this list that would like to, to apply for five or ten thousand dollars but they just aren't aware that this, this reoccurs? So we, we put out, it's an, an informal announcement, but we do post on our website the opportunity for people to come and apply. And we've every year we get calls uh, or emails from organizations that haven't received funding in the past um, that have applied. And a good number of the entities that are on this list that um, particularly in years 16 and 17 that didn't receive funding previously uh, learned about the opportunity through, through those, those informal solicitations. Yeah, and that gets, again, back to Mrs. Baker's point that it would be nice to see fresh names on here also uh, of folks that maybe we can help them out once every two or three years uh, out there from that standpoint, it, uh, as opposed to uh, there, there are some great programs on here, but also there's probably other great programs that are veteran-oriented in, in, in town here. Um, and I only because I know that uh, come the spring, the Fisher House will be ribbon cutting on that facility, and then the real uh, demand for the operational piece comes into play to be able to take the children that come there with their service member and take them to the museums and take them to places like that. So the the fund drive is going to start all over again now that the capital has been done uh, to move into the operational piece, which is going to be reoccurring for every veteran service member's family who's going to be staying at these Fisher Houses. So. Uh, again, it's a different line item. It should not even be put into this line, I wouldn't think, because this was the capital funding. I would like it to be standalone as a separate line item should they apply uh, next year for operational dollars. So with that, uh, I know we've got some folks here that are going to be 
at least on listed on this. Would they like to speak? Uh, Ms. Rosacco, Claire, would you like to talk? Because I noticed that that uh, Tri-C is, is one of the big recipients on this. Would you, uh, would somebody like to talk on this? Or Rick, uh, both of you? Okay, great. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, my name's Claire Rosacco and I'm with Cuyahoga Community College and would just deeply like to thank you for the help for our veteran students. I have with me Rick Deschant, who's our Executive Director of Veteran Services at the college. And just to kind of put some parameters around it, we usually, um, for every semester, have roughly between seven and 800 veteran students attend Tri-C. We have one of the largest veteran services programs and students populations in the state of Ohio. And I'd love for Rick to share with you how the funds will be used. Thank you. Mr. Sharon, distinguished members, of the council. Um, one of the unique things about Tri-C is uh, a, a little demographics here. Our average student is usually about 24 years old. The average age of our student veteran is 35. Wow. 40 percent are married. So some of the demands are a little bit different on finances. We still also have a, a cluster of Vietnam veterans, Cold War veterans. Uh, come out on a Friday when we do our 60 plus program, you will see one or two World War II veterans floating around the campuses. That being said, we do have a contingent within our enrollment of that 600, 700 of older veterans who no longer are eligible for any type of military education benefit, whether it be the GI Bill in its various forms or vocational rehabilitation, Ohio National Guard scholarship. And what this award has been able to do for us is give those older veterans who came home, did it right, got laid off or downsized, a chance to come back into the workforce and into college. And that's a key criteria of our award. You have to have exhausted or have no benefits left. So the majority of the recipients of the dollars you have made available are older. Two years ago, uh, it was a, a generous award. We were able to award 93 scholarships to older veterans. Uh, and this year with the current award that you were so gracious with, we awarded 62 scholarships. So that's just around 100 some more than that, 150 some, have been able to get a second chance of being part of a dynamic workforce in Northeast Ohio. Thank you to this council and their generosity. Well, and Ms. Simon is the chair of our education committee, and so I know that this is, this is it's a twofer for her in the, the, the veteran side and the education side, so it's, uh, it's, it's exciting to hear, uh, hear that. Uh, and I see that they're also uh, towards employment on, on here too, as far as, uh, uh, the background. So, if there's somebody, is, is there somebody going to be somebody here to speak on on uh, on that? Hello. Hi. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Adora Schmidl with Towards Employment. And I just wanted to thank all of the esteemed council members for your support. Last year, we were able to serve 30 veterans with Career Pathway Services. And these are services that help folks prepare for a job, whether they've been downsized or they have a criminal record, which the majority of the veterans we serve do, um, to prepare for a job, get a job, keep a job, and most importantly for us at Towards Employment, advance into a career with family sustaining wages and benefits. So I'd like to thank you. This year we hope to serve um, 20 veterans with the amount we've received. Thank you. Great, thank you. And Ms. Simon, again, it's a, a twofer also because towards employment uh, also, we've we heard some great things about that in, in her committee um, just uh, just recently. So that's that's great. Is there anyone else here? Uh, we would like to, have, we'd love to have a chance to hear if any of the recipients are here, we'd love to have a chance to talk. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Council Members. Uh, Marty Murphy from the Corrections Planning Board, uh, Court of Common Pleas. And I can, I can address uh, Councilwoman Simon's question regarding the uh, Veterans Treatment Court and the dollars. Uh, Veterans Treatment Court started, we got a small, a small subsidy through this pool of funding in uh, late spring or early summer 2015 and started the Veterans Treatment Court. Uh, and we were awarded that fall, beginning 1 October with the federal year, 
uh, $325,000 per year for each of the next three years for a total of $975,000. That money came from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration under HHS, which is the same body that funds our uh, other drug court, recovery court, uh, specialized dockets. The funding for the Veterans Treatment Court is completely firewalled from those other specialized dockets being the same funding has its own index codes and is operated completely separately separate than than those so there's no bleed over from veterans into say judge Matias mat court uh, we were fortunate enough uh, to receive an additional award from samsa once again uh, this fall in the amount of two million dollars for five additional years so it increased the dollar amount uh, from 375 or 325 a year up to 400,000 a year for each of the next five years. Uh, as was indicated, uh, we did uh, around uh, 57 vets per year average. We came in around 170 for the three year window. In the new one, we're anticipating that we will be able to serve with the extra little bit of money and help from the VA, uh, 75 veterans each of the five years. So the money is firewalled. It doesn't, it doesn't commingle, and it serves only veterans. Oh, thank you. And I, and I think that the folks in the Veterans Service Commission can get a secondary benefit out of this conversation that they know that even though these funds weren't spent by them, they were used for purposes that are near and dear to their hearts on, on things like education and the service uh, members in the, in the courts uh, out there. So I think it's a phenomenal uh, way to... To, to make that statement out there. Absolutely, okay. and, and I'd like to say thank you. We really do appreciate it, and it does give us that that gap funding for this quarter that we don't get going with the new grant until January 1. Well, we appreciate that, and we know it's a, it's a tough docket uh, to be working on. Thank, thank you. you. Good afternoon. I'm Colleen Cotter with the Legal Aid Society of Cleveland. And as my colleagues have just all said, thank you. Thank you for your vision in terms of not putting this back into general funding and focusing on, on veterans. Um, and I think you can see from today the variety of um, programs. And we all work together, which we could spend an hour talking about all the partnerships that are here in this room today. But I just want to highlight three things about the work that Legal Aid has done for veterans uh, with funding from the county. Um, one is that last year uh, we handled 578 cases involving veterans, uh, resulting in impacting 970 veterans and their family members. Um, and in our annual report that we provided, we highlighted some outcomes. One of those I'm particularly proud of, you know, at Legal Aid we focus on shelter, safety, and economic security. And last year, we were able to increase veterans' income, increase their assets, and decrease their debts by a combined $840,000. Um, so those are, those are real dollars. That's not using any multiplier economic study thing. That's real dollars in low-income veterans' pockets. Um, the second thing I want to highlight is our partnerships. We do a monthly clinic at the VA uh, CRRC, uh, community, I never remember what CRRC means. You all know what it is. Uh, so we do a monthly clinic there, walk-in clinic, where uh, veterans can walk in and we provide legal assistance. That has been such a strong partnership for us, reaching vulnerable veterans. A lot of the veterans who are trying to get back into the VA system because of their discharge status and haven't been able to, and we're able to get them that changed and back into the system. And this year we're honoring the VA CRRC at our annual luncheon because their partnership is so incredibly strong. And I'm sure all of my colleagues here would have stories to tell like that. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to highlight was going to uh, Councilwoman Baker's question about um, our reliance on these funds. Um, I don't want to pretend like we don't rely on the funds. Of course we do. If we didn't, then it would be meaningless for you to allocate them. So the, the dollars are incredibly valuable, but we at Legal Aid, and I'm sure all of our partner organizations, 
work really hard to leverage those dollars philanthropically through other government grants. Um, so, you know, if we provided a full budget of all the veteran services, you would see your dollars leveraged tremendously multiple times over, uh, which doesn't at all diminish the value of those dollars because without that, we couldn't leverage. So thank you very much for your support and I'd ha be happy to answer any questions if you have them. I don't think so. Thank you. Th thank you very much. Good afternoon, Tim Grayless from the United Way 211. Um, I want to thank you all again. Um, and to address uh, uh, Ms. Baker's uh, thing, yeah, she, she's right. We do rely on those funds, but um, there are, was a year that we did not receive any funds and we still continued with our program because we believe so strongly in what we do. Uh, since we started the program back in 2013, we've had about 38,000 calls from our veteran population here in Cuyahoga County. Works out to about five to 600 a month. Um, so I think it is a vital effort. Um, I also work a lot with our different community partners uh, in doing the advocacy for our veterans. So not only are they calling and getting the resources, then they get to me as a tier two specialist and then uh, I make sure that I either make that phone call for them or help our vets and it is a crucial part of what we do at 211, and I do want to thank you guys for what you do, and, and thanks for the, the funding that you do give us. Any questions? Sure. The, um, the dollars that are given for this, um, for veterans initially, could you go to, the, to that source and say, I need $70,000 to perform the 211 um, initiative, and is that not been a good uh, communication chain for you to um, rather than uh, look for the excess funds that aren't spent? Uh, are you talking like if I went to the Veteran Service Commission and actually talked to them about yes. it? Yes. Um, it is a conversation that has been had um, because we do handle 26 counties in Ohio and we'd love to spread our program to other things. I do believe to uh, for their charter there are some restrictions on how that would have to be worked out. So yeah, that is a conversation that has been had and it is something that we would look forward to. Um, and, and the conversation has come to the point where it's even been if we could do something and then I would actually be housed in the Veteran Service Commission. So if somebody came in, then they could just send them right down the hall to me versus saying, hey, when you leave, call 211 and that type of stuff. So those conversations have been had. It's just whether or not they can do it because of their charter. And that was part of it. That was when we initially set it up. That was some of the contingencies that were hard to get over those hurdles based on what the state law allowed coming out of out of Columbus and that. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, comments? Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, I know that we heard some comments about how uh, important these funds are to these various organizations, and uh, the question came up: uh, Do you, as the fund receiver recipients, rely on these these funds, but I know as a veteran, it's just the opposite. We relied on you to provide us with this country, and uh, so our hats off to um, all the veterans for for that. And I'm uh, proud that we've we've been able to do this because we've had some you know we have good things we feel about things we do on HHS and education and all these other areas. This is one of the areas that we can feel good about. Uh, what we do and, and I hope uh, not that we're looking for the media to give any accolades to us we're looking for it to give to you and I hope the media who's out there who's listening to the, these these broadcasts right now writes the stories that you told not anything about us but about what you told as far as how these monies are used and I, I would really encourage the media to actually uh, to, to do something in regards to that because these are your county dollars at work on behalf of the veterans thank you very much is there any other comments or Discussions? Uh, hearing none, is there any changes or additions or deletions to the uh, uh, schedule as, as set forth by Mr. King? Hearing none, uh, I will move that we uh, adopt the uh, item uh, that has been read in the record. Is there a second? Is there a second? Okay. Anybody else want to be named as a sponsor on just at the, at the present time? I do. Anybody else? Okay. Uh, we'll unanimously uh, name all. Uh, committee members, uh, is there, uh, it's been moved and seconded. Is there any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? 
thank you very much for all your hard work. And, and, and Mr. King, thank you uh, for all that you do to, to make this thing happen, too. If we can read the uh, what was uh, identified as 5A into the record, please. Resolution number 2018-0185, authorize, authorizing a development loan in the amount not to exceed $10 million to Playhouse Square Foundation for the benefit of the Lumen at Playhouse Square project to be located at 1600 Euclid Avenue in the city of Cleveland. Okay. Mr. Huth, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just up to speed. We had three items, as I recall, that we're, you're going to bring us up to speed on. Yes. Do uh, okay. you, you need me to do a recap? or? Uh, why don't, yes, please. Why don't okay. you do a recap? Uh, uh, this is the 34-story, uh, approximately 318-unit apartment building that the uh, Playhouse Square Foundation is putting up at the corner of 17th and Euclid. It's a uh, $10 million, very short-term, four- to five-year loan. It coincides with their construction lending. It's going to be at 3.5% a year. It's an interest only during that four- to five-year term. Uh, one of the questions from last time was general interest rates that we would otherwise get with this money. I talked with Treasury on Friday, and, and the, the, a, um, a, um, a federal Treasury note for about this term for this amount of money would only get us around 3%. And uh, the daily rate they get in their accounts right now is around 2%. So you can see we're, we're really doing better for the county by way of this way we structured this loan. Uh, the other question we had was about jobs. We only talked about 10 at that time. Uh, with further discussion with the folks at uh, Playhouse Square, it's uh, more like 26. They've got about eight in the property management side, a dozen in the garage, and in the retail they're expecting about six. So it's about 26 is the total jobs, uh, FTEs. And then I think the last question you had was about where is the money coming from? And uh, I want to thank uh, Maggie Keenan, Director of OBM. She sent a, a very detailed email explaining all that. That's just why I asked her to do that, because I couldn't do that. <laughs> but generally, uh, what we'll say is that about $5 million of it is coming out of the county's reserves, uncommitted money at this point. And other, the other $5 million is coming out of what I'm going to call economic development reserves with a lowercase r. We've got about $4 million that's dedicated to that account that hasn't been committed to anything at this point, and about a million that's committed but we're probably not going to spend in the short term. So we'll put those two things together, or those three things together, I guess, and come up with the, the $10 million for the, the loan. Okay, so at the last meeting, we the, the conversation was that we, uh, at least from the podium, was uh, there was $10 million coming out of the general fund, but now, based on Maggie's uh, Ms. Keenan's, sorry about that, uh, right up on that, uh, it, it appears as though it's five and five. Correct, uh, correct. And then okay. she's doing that, I, I believe, to keep in, in, keep in balance with that uh, the comment you made about reserves, the council one Simon made about reserves at the last meeting. Right, and uh, that's, I think that'll be the last time anybody asked for that kind of level of detail. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was very detailed. It was fantastic. It was, it, the I's were dotted, the T's were crossed, and, uh, and my eyes were crossed after finished reading it uh, out there, but it was, it was very that's clear. That's why I didn't attempt it. <laughs> yeah. um, th those are, those are the, the points uh, that we asked uh, to be researched out there. Uh, is there any discussion on any of those three points you can, that, that came up? Okay. Uh, hearing no discussion, uh, it was, go ahead. Just a, a question of the clerk. Has this been read a second time? It's not been read in the public. No, no. This, okay. It, it only gets read a second time when it gets to the council meeting. I just didn't know if any of the meetings in between. That no, it can't get out. It can't get read a second okay. time until it gets out of this committee. Okay. Uh, this will be sent to the, from this committee to the floor for a second reading and then from there a third reading. Well, I'd, I'd like to ask that we, we pass it under suspension at the second reading on the 23rd. Uh, I recall the presentation, I, I, I hate to say it, uh, but I recall the presentation from the, um, the folks at Playhouse Square was that they had 60 days and they had all the time they needed. We are still <laughs> going to hit that within the, within the window. Um, I don't yeah, mean to say the burden easy. falls on your department, but the burden falls on your department to get the contracts written and get them all prepared. Um, so uh, I'm going to live within the four corners of what uh, well, the borrower normal. said. Uh, okay. Uh, and so I had to ask. So. Well, and I had to at least recall what I, what was presented. So the uh, uh, the obligations are going to switch over to legal. I assume mm -hmm. the legal has started to do to do the drafting, and uh, I can tell you that at least if it follows the sequence, it'll come out of here. It'll get voted on at second. Uh, it'll have a second reading next week. It'll have its third reading. It'll get voted on, and it'll be on the county executive's desk mm -hmm. that next morning, uh, mm -hmm. and then. The whole burden then falls to the county executive right. to make sure he turns that around and gets it out and up and running. 
Okay, thank you. So uh, with that, uh, I will move uh, that it get uh, sent to the uh, full council chambers for a second reading. Is there a second? Second. To be moved and second. Is there any discussion? Hearing no discussion, uh, all in favor of moving this for a second reading, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Uh, the motion carries. Uh, move Thank to the know. second reading, and it'll be read next uh, Tuesday for a second reading. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And we have one item, le one, one other item left, uh, and that was this was not initially on our uh, our update uh, list, but uh, because we thought this would take less than uh, half hour, and we're right close to half an hour, that uh, uh, at this point the uh, chief of economic development asked, could he bring up bring us up to speed on the loan portfolio and where we are? So with that, Mr. Carter, will yes, sir. Uh, Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I uh, trust that you've had an opportunity, Theodore Carter, Ted Carter, Chief Economic Development and Business Officer for Cuyahoga County, wanted to just summarize in some brief comments, less than five minutes on my behalf, the October 1st memo that I sent the council members providing an update on the status of the loan portfolio. Then I'm going to introduce and invite up the loan portfolio team to give a more detailed presentation of the status overview of our portfolio. So that's how we'd like to proceed, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Well, under the assumption that, that no one else uh, that's listening to this uh, on bated breath has that same piece of information, though, instead of, of uh, yes, we have it up here, but no, nobody else okay. uh, out there has heard it. So if you can go through your five-minute uh, brief uh, sure. or whatever it takes to, to tee this up for the, the loan that. portfolio. I'll summarize uh, that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Pleased to present this loan portfolio update. I trust that you've had an opportunity to review the loan portfolio status memo dated October 1st, 2018. I'm going to take five minutes to summarize that memo and then introduce our loan portfolio team who will walk you through a PowerPoint overview of the portfolio. Since the spring of 2016, the Department of Development team with assistance from Ernst & Young and the county's economic development improvement team has spent several thousand hours working to perfect the county's dynamic and complex loan portfolio. This has occurred in three phases. One, understanding the problem and developing a remediation strategy led by Ernst & Young and myself. Phase two, discovering and identification of all loans. Uh, that was done by the Economic Development Improvement Team and led by Heather Refford and myself. Phase three, remediation, validation, and correction of identified issues within the portfolio, and that has been led by the loan portfolio team. The loan portfolio team, which didn't exist uh, a year ago during this time when we provided the last formal update on the portfolio, consists of uh, the loan portfolio manager, Brian Edwards, the assistant loan portfolio manager, Sona Lahoti. Uh, Brian was hired a year ago in November of 2017. Sona was onboarded and hired uh, in March of this year. Uh, Deputy Director Greg Huth, uh, a position that is to be filled, an administrative assistant who is going to be responsible for records management and retention of the portfolio, and myself. As a result of intensive forensic work, weekly portfolio review meetings, and discussions with the Inspector General, I can now report with confidence the number of loans and their status that the county has approved and that are in our loan system of record portfolio. Uh, this reflects the number of loans that we are aware of. That number is 297 loans. The oldest loan dates back to 1996. We have addressed the major deficiency cited by the Inspector General in his 2015 and 2016 reports. I'll highlight several key results. Since September of 2017, we have regularly invoiced all borrowers, which has resulted in more consistent borrower engagement, resulting in consistent repayments, and an increase in the collection of late fees. Each of the 297 loans that I just mentioned that we are aware of have been entered into portfolio. We have also established access and security protocols in portfolio, as well as a mandatory training regime for loan officers and fiscal staff. We have segregated loan origination and loan collections duties, increased uh, the amount of resources devoted to loan portfolio management and professionalized staff uh, and have created a loan portfolio management team. That did not exist a year ago. We have published twice this year on the DOD website 
a list of all active loans. This procedure will continue and is now memorialized as an expectation in both our policy and procedures manuals, which had not existed previously. Um, all of these were major recommendations and deficiencies that the uh, Inspector General had identified, which we've addressed. And I would say the last result is uh, a stronger and better, more improved working relationship with the Inspector General. Well, the portfolio is no longer in critical condition, and we are well on our way to returning it to full health. As well, we are on our way to be able to measure portfolio performance with the goal of providing more value to county businesses who are our customers. We have two remaining commitments. Uh, to the Inspector General, we've committed by the end of the year or sooner to have reviewed all loans in portfolio, verified documentation versus our new loan checklist, which is another enhancement that has been done over the last uh, two and a half years. Uh, this will ensure that we have all documents that are required to demonstrate enforceability of the county position in any legal proceedings. Uh, number two, to the executive, we have committed that by April 1st, 2019, we will be, and I'll say, be done with this effort. And that will be almost three years exactly to the date that we began. Done is defined as accurate billing within the portfolio, accurate collection of payments within the portfolio, loan documentation and integrity, and verification that all repayment terms are accurately entered in portfolio. Uh, before I uh, call up the loan portfolio management team and just introduce them, um, special thanks. And so we're not done. And so if I had to summarize, Mr. Chairman, I'd say pleased with our effort but not satisfied. We still have the last mile to go here in terms of closing this out, but a uh, significant improvement since we were before you last formally a year ago. Uh, thanks for this uh, effort and results goes to the entire Department of Development staff, almost all of whom have rallied around and contributed to this effort. Uh, our loan portfolio management team in particular, Brian Edwards, Sona Lahoti, uh, Greg Huth, uh, Sarah Parks Jackson, and uh, Paul Herdick, who served as interim loan portfolio manager uh, for a period of time last year. Uh, Executive Budish and his team specifically and particularly the Office of Budget and Management, who has provided ongoing support. Uh, this committee for your oversight and pushing us with questions and keeping us accountable in this effort and our partnership with the Inspector General and his team. Uh, with that, uh, I'd like to call up the... Uh, well, before, before we do sure. that, uh, seeing how you're the director, uh, will are there any questions for the director while we have... Uh, his attention uh, before we get to the, uh, the loan portfolio team. Well, you always have my attention. Even if I'm I understand that. <laughs> yes, it, but we also have you at the microphone, too. Sure, so sure. any questions? Okay. Uh, I just have a couple just to make sure uh, I'm up to speed with where you are and what you just said. Of the 297 uh, loans, um, did anyone, ob any of the folks object that they had a loan itself, uh, when, the, when we came back and said, you owe us money and uh, you have a loan with us? No, I don't think, and Mr. Uh, Edwards can answer this more definitively, if anyone has objectives, there's always been a discussion in some instances around the loan terms. Yeah, okay, that, that's, that's yeah. going to be my next question right. as far as the terms itself, the interest rate. Right, so Mr. Edwards can ask, answer okay. that more definitively, but in general, no one has objected to whether they owe money or not, but it's always been the amount of money owed to the county. Okay, so so we're talking about the interest rate, the loans, uh, the payments, all those kind of things. Uh, but no one he asked us to, to write it off saying they didn't owe us the money. Not to my knowledge, no. Okay, all right. Well, then let's go on to the portfolio managers then. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sure. Um, along those same lines, um, in not looking at the past but looking at the future, mm -hmm. Are you confident now that everything is in place, that the next time perhaps anyone audits or whether it's the auditor or the inspector general looks in your practices, that these type of things will not come up again, that everything is as it should be and invoiced and the procedures are in place and this legacy is just that in the past? Sure. Uh, great question, uh, Councilwoman. I can't guarantee that, but I can tell you that I have a higher level of confidence and this is the fact that I felt confident enough to present this report uh, would light years ahead of where we are. I would say the focus and diligence is there. We still need to add some resources. We have uh, procedures in place that we didn't have before. So we have a dynamic and complex portfolio that we are simplifying. So mistakes, even in the, with the best intentions, can happen. So I'm not going to guarantee that there will never be any audit findings. But I'm comfortable standing behind the work the team has done 
and uh, that I've committed to, and so that I can say uh, with certainty. Sure. Um, so when someone has a loan and it's been approved and they're in the docket, they are now in a different place than what they would have been, say, five or ten years ago, where you have procedures in place Correct. for billing and monthly and follow-ups and right. you know all those kind of things that you're right. confident that those type of things, not just looking at the past, but looking toward the future, you have in place to... So we don't revisit this again. Yes, and uh, you know, obviously over time, that those things will be audited, and you know as they should be, and so we'll respond to any uh, issues that are identified. But I can tell you, just the rigor, the focus, the level of detail and attention by only, not only myself but the loan portfolio management team, uh, and the fact that we've been, you know, some people say, "Well, why aren't you done yet?" Because we're look, repairing the past while also instituting rigor in the future. So there's examples where. Disbursements were made where we have a check and balance now that didn't exist. So before any disbursements are made currently, the loan portfolio management team reviews the loan agreement and makes sure that our, everything is uh, in sync with our loan checklist, and then that, is, that disbursement is authorized. So that is a level of rigor that wasn't there before. But again, we have a you know complicated organization, so mistakes will, can always happen. But... There's, we have the intent now of rigor oversight and the resources in place uh, to do that. And so we're still looking at how to enhance that. Just <clears throat> one technical question that was always there at the time we were reviewing. Do you now have an automatic billing in place that those loans that are given to us that are making monthly payments, are they automatically billed? With and human intervention, yes. So the... Loan portfolio manager review Brian, Mr. Edwards reviews the loan agreement and institutes the billing process, but that could be done through portfolio. Is that your question? Which okay. I think is what you're referring to. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Questions on that? Um, I didn't, was there a question over there? <laughs> I, 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 thought, I saw the hands going up. I thought that's unusual. She. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so if we had the IG in here, where would they be as far as their high percentage of? of satisfaction with where we are at this point in the process. I, I'm not going to speak for the IG. Okay. I did share a draft of this with him. We met before his uh, presentation before Ms. Baker's committee. I think he would agree with my assessment that we've made significant progress. He would also uh, tell us to be vigilant and complete the work. So the two elements that I just mentioned that we have to get done by year end and by April, he would insist that we make sure that, that we don't fall behind in that regard. But I can't handicap whether you would give us 80, 90, certainly wouldn't be 100 percent, but I think he would concur that we've made material progress toward fixing this problem. And I think he said that. Uh, the state auditor, uh, any, any issues going on there? Uh, they had one or two uh, right. issues that we've responded to. Um, so, um, And have they seen where we are at this point in time as far as the progress? I don't think we sent them a copy of this report, nor have we briefed them, but it just we seems respond to, to any questions that they've had, so we'll make a note to... Yeah, it seems like sure we ought to be proactive. And then back to Ms. Baker's. Are we receiving things like ACHs and stuff like that from uh, these folks? We're not set up to do that yet, but that is something that would be on its to-do list. Okay, I mean, it's, it's easy. It saves us all money and it saves us all time, so mm -hmm. it just seems to make, make sense that we go to Agreed. ACH on that. Okay. Um, sure. Uh, I do remember now with the questions um, that the Inspector General was asking if this was going to be re completed by the end of the year. Uh, I think it was a little um, vague uh, at the time of his reporting whether that, in fact, was going to happen. Do you know at this time in October whether you will be actually finished to close the book on this the end of December? Well, the uh, review that we've committed to him will be uh, – in all likelihood completed by the year end to the standard that we committed to the exact. We have a higher standard that we've committed to to him in terms of done completely. So would you like me to just review what I uh, articulated in that regard? I guess I'm just curious to know when you think you can close the book on completing this part of the legacy so that you can be free to move forward. So April 1st of 2019 would be the uh, okay. appropriate answer. April 1st. Yes. All right. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? Okay. Let's hear from uh, the Loan Portfolio Committee. Okay. Our, so com our commissioner. What, what, what are we calling it's all, it? I don't know if all of them, but uh, Greg Huth will lead the uh, okay. presentation, and I do, do want to make sure he gets some 
airtime so you can see him physically because he's not been formally. Brian Edwards is the loan portfolio manager, and then Sona Lahoti is the assistant loan portfolio manager. So this is our team that we have in place that just done a terrific job and really are owed a terrific debt of gratitude for going above and beyond in terms of helping uh, repair this. But there's been a clerk of effort that I've identified others that have contributed. But with that, let me... Uh... Okay, thank you. Okay, we're going to go to the PowerPoint now. This is, is short, but it's, I think it says a lot about what Brian and Sona have accomplished over the last several months. So we, how do I do this? Do I just... Oops. Sorry. Okay. So now I'm going to start off actually with some definitions here because it's, these, these things are kind of important. Ted mentioned 297 is in portfolio. Portfolio is our archive. It holds all of the loans that we know about from 1996 forward. Some of those have been repaid. Some of those have been taken care of over the, over the years. So when that's the, the reason I'm bringing this up is you look at the first definition on this slide, it's an active loan. An active loan is one that's been approved and it's still outstanding. It's where the borrower still owes us money. And the reason I don't want to, I'm trying to make sure there isn't any confusion here is that when you go click on this link that takes you to the list that we've put online, you'll see that there's 199 there, not 297. Because that 199 is the loans that are outstanding, where borrowers still owe the county money. So there's no confusion about that. And then this come up, comes up again with this next slide. This slide has 265 on it, rather than 297. And that's different, because these are the loans that have been dispersed. That's not the entire 297. There's at least 11 loans that have been approved that haven't been dispersed yet for any number of reasons. A couple of them died before we got that far. There's at least 21 of them here that fall into this category of brownfield commercial re redevelopment re revolving loan fund loans that we just don't know enough about yet. So that's why that we can't put them in any of these categories here. But that, so when you take that 265 plus those 21 BRF, CRF loans that we just don't know enough about, plus the 11 that haven't been dispersed, that's how you get to 297. Now this slide has another piece of information on it that I think is really critical because I know there was a lot of talk in 16 and 17 about, about uh, default rates. And you see and look at the, uh, the line labeled third party administered, you see there's 149 loans there out of the 265 that we have. And those third party administered loans were programs that the county set up to be high risk. They were meant to be for startups, for technology companies just getting off the ground. And you see that's where the majority of the defaults are, the largest defaults. About 51% of that por portion of the portfolio is where the delinquencies are. What's and those the aging on those? Uh, I'm really, sorry? What's the aging on those? The third it, party? It's all over the board. There are some that we're working with to try and get them back in shape. Some that Sona and Brian have met with, like they've got really promising technologies. And when you look at their financials, they're this close. So we're working with, with these folks. What's, the, so, what's, what's the, the aging from the oldest to the, the current on that 149? In terms of the... the well, how, does any, do any of them date back to 1996? Um, I'm just trying to figure out. Are, are, these, are these loans that we did during our tenure, uh, are these loans that predated us, and what's the kind of balance? Well, most of these predated the conversion over to account. So that's, what I'm, I'm, yeah. that's what I'm just trying to get. I'm trying to get right. the, the 140, not that... Right. It makes it any better for the county, but right. we still got eight, eight and a half million dollars. Only, uh, only about 14 of those NCO loans were done since, no, that's this administration. I, uh, since 2010, do you need to have a no offhand, Brian? Um, I know seven have been done. Uh, Brian Edwards, uh, for the record. Um, we've had seven since the current administration, um, 15 to 18, and prior to that, um, I don't want to speak to a number unless I have it right in front of me. So, uh, okay. Well, if you could just, if you could just nail the one forty nine down as oh, to, yeah, I can, I can. Yeah. You, yeah. You're referring to the dates because I can break it down. We know one hundred and four are from new product development, which range from the mid two thousands up to two thousand fourteen fifteen. Then we have forty one North Coast Opportunity mm -hmm. uh, Technology Fund that range from the same period. Um, the last new North Coast Opportunity Loan was issued in 2016, um, and those are five-year term loans. Um, and then we have an old program, um, 
that I wasn't you know being here here. It's called the WICO microloan program. So that's comprises 149. Um, we do have, because of the addition of all the data into portfolio and recon recognizing and validating, validating that, we do have the actual settlement dates that we can get for you as well. I think the three target dates that we've always tried to group as, a, as, a, as this body, predated, new charter, prior administration, current administration. And just that we've got three little nice buckets for the 149, uh, obviously the one... Some of the stuff that predated the charter, we can't do a heck of a lot of other than, other than put the burden on you guys to try and collect the money. Sure. Right. Okay. And we do have that information mm -hmm. available, so yeah. just Good. breaking it out. Thanks. So the, what's key, I think, then about this slide, then, is when you see the, the blended uh, delinquency rate on the whole portfolio, is only 7%. That's pretty good. Which That's, is a pretty good rate. It is. You know? So, and when you look at the ones that were actually, all the other those loans were actually underwritten in-house. The third party loans weren't underwritten by us. But the, in, the ones, the other loans or programs are underwritten by us and gone through CIC. You can see the default rates are really low on those. So that's, I think that's a really critical thing because it speaks to the kind of the, the robustness of our process and working with the CIC to, to make sure we're, get, we're making good deals. Do we have the aging at 7.02? How old that aging is? Is that, is that sitting out there 90 days, 120 days, uh, 180 It's certainly two years? well beyond, a uh, majority of them are well beyond the um, 120 days. Yeah. And those are uh, subset subsetted into the 66 we still have remaining in collection, which we're moving forward on whether or not we uh, are able to um, enforce our rights and what we can do when enforcing our rights, what we can retrieve from enforcing our rights. Okay. Can you go to the next one? Now, this is an observation that was made by the Lean Six Sigma team about a year ago about some of the, the, the big problem that we had in terms of invoicing. And uh, then, then it was an accurate, uh, it was an accurate observation. Now you click to the next slide, and it gives you an idea of the progress that we've made through invoicing regularly. This this slide outlines the revenue we've been generating in terms of interest, late fees, principal that we get from repayments because we're invoicing regularly. The nice thing about invoicing regularly is it makes the borrower look at the balance and say, "Gee, that's right," or "It's not right." And then we get engaged, or I should say Brian gets engaged, and then we start doing things like digging through revenue receipts and digging through disbursement vouchers. So we know that we've got our numbers right before we go back to the borrower with, uh, uh, with any, uh, resolving any issues. But in, in, believe it or not, in most cases, the borrowers are happy to get calls from us or they'd be hearing from us because they know that we now have the folks in place who, who understand what's going on and can deal with their questions. So this is another kind of a critical point. With the regular invoicing, this is the progress we've been making over the over the last few months. I, I don't want to simplify it, but if you give somebody a bill, they, 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 that's that's a well along the way towards getting it right. paid. Right. If you don't give me a, if you don't send the people a bill, it get, gets forgotten. And unfortunately, it still is a paper process. Uh, we we get checks. It gets a little confusing sometimes when uh, cash when checks are coming in for taxes. We've seen some of our checks get deposited, credited toward their tax bills. But OBM has always been able to work with us, and their treasury has been able to work with us and unwind those things and get them into our credit, the proper accounts. And, and we might even think about with the ACH giving them a discount if they if they if they go into automatic payments. Yeah, we've been talking about that. Hopefully, it's something we'll be able to put in in the latter phases of the ERP. But at this point, it's it's not that's not a possibility. So. Hmm. I wouldn't think it would, it's an ERP situation anyway. But anyway. And then this is our last slide. Um, again, it, this one talks strictly to, to late fees and the advantages that we've been able to generate for us by, again, invoicing regularly. And it shows an 85% increase from those last two time periods that, uh, that match up there. So it's really, um, re again, we, we're, you know, we're doing this the way it's supposed to be done, finally. So Now, uh, I know one of the questions that uh, Ted got asked a bit ago is about the state auditor. And we have been in constant conversations with them throughout the first quarter of this year. They are, you know, addressed issues that we had uh, from 2017 and the, and the steps that we've put in place to make sure those things don't repeat themselves in 2018. They seem okay with the, re the answers that we're giving them, the responses that we're giving them. So we're pretty sure we're on the right track here. What's the worthiness of our uh, of our uh, collateral at this point? Worthiness of any of, of all, on these loans that are at that 7.06. Uh, do we have a do we do we have a collateral that we could go attach if we needed to? Well, that's actually part of the, the thing that we're, we've committed to have done by the end of this year is we're going through all of the, the documents and actually being sure we can put our hands or our eyes on all of our collateral documents. 
We've spent, actually, our, we did our first work session over the weekend, got through about a third of the, the whole portfolio to see what documents we have and which ones we need to go out and get uh, re-executed re and things like that. So it's, it's, a, it's a good question. It's not some one I have a good answer for you, though. So. And so I would think that all these high-risk ones are ones that we, this committee would have asked, is there a personal guarantee on these? And so, therefore, that's, a, that's some of our collaterals. Those, uh, those high-risk ones, the program did not require any guarantees. Uh -oh. Uh, at, at best, we had UCCs on you know, intellectual property and a few things like that. So, yeah. okay, well, let's. I'll have a credit that it's a high risk credit that that's mm -hmm. that hasn't been under our tenure. We haven't been doing that. that, that, that those had to be the pre, the pre county charter ones. Mm -hmm. I'd be willing to bet. Yeah. So that gives you an idea of the information we've been able to kind of put in place through uh, the, through the first uh, nine months of the year and. It's just uh, going to be getting, be getting better is from, from what I can see. Well, it is getting better. I like the fact you're charging interest rates. Uh, <laughs> I like the fact you're charging for late payments. I like the fact that we're actually sending an invoice out. Uh, I think those are, those are all basic blocking and tackling in the, in the loan business. Um, Ms. Baker? I had a question on the, um, the on the late fees. I understand certainly the principal and interest that's negotiated up front. They know that that's what their payment's going to be. But the late fees, um, why is it that they uh, are late? I mean, they are making their payments. Are they, and when does the late fee kick in? After 30, 31st day, or is it after 60 days? Is there a grace period? How is that late fee managed? First, uh, first and foremost, the late fee is always assessed correctly, and there's no ifs, ands, or buts. There's, it's a late fee, it's due and payable. Um, and to your point on when does a a late fee become due. Um, most of our loans do have a 10-day grace period. 10. Um, and if on the 11th day it's not received and um, because of the mail processing, things like that, we use postmark date um, for that. So, um, and it's typically a percentage that's agreed upon in the loan agreement. So um, typically memorialized in the promissory note as well. So it's really official. So if we ever had to enforce our actions in court, we could go for late fees as well. Um, but the, the, the significant increase is simply a result of just knowing right. what people had and then generating invoices that included late fees on them. Now, right. my first month on the job when we started these invoices, um, you know, that borrow engagement was 100%. I was getting calls from everybody because they were questioning, what is this fee? Right. And in some cases, it was a matter of going back. That if they produced evidence of a check, just because we could not find evidence of payment or thing like that uh, within a period and use that check date, we could reconcile that. But a majority of them were saying, oh, well, you're right. And then hence the 85% increase in that period over time. And uh, year to date, we're almost at 15,000. Um, wow. So we're, you know, and again, that could be somebody who's not 30 days late, but 12 days late. Right. And, you know, we're, with real estate, uh, um, uh, large part of our portfolio um, a lot of the borrowers uh, rely on the proceeds of the project which is rent or lease payments and uh, not everybody pays on the first they may pay in the third so um, the point is uh, that we're accurately assessing the late fees and uh, unless there's credible case for this late fee not being accurate then mm -hmm. we're enforcing it be paid in full all right thank you any other questions in regards to that uh, you indicated I heard two dates. One, one was a December 31st date that you thought you're going to have most of this up to speed. You're going to be on April 1st uh, by the end of the quarter of first quarter. Uh, you would have, um, you believe, everything in the book, uh, as I think was, was the language. Will yep. that include the identification of collateral on these, all these loans? Yes. And, and, and find out whether, I'm, I'm sure uh it's probably pretty late to be securing them so i hope that they're all secured with the ucc filings and whatever else we need to do way before this yeah f yes correct and what we're doing now as ted had mentioned previously um prior to closing or prior to disbursement we're making sure we have everything that was called for in a loan agreement um ucc financing statements are significant and important but what's most important on a majority of the the portfolio that we have is a mortgage or a personal or corporate guarantee Right, because that's underwritten to reflect if the project's unable to meet the demands of the repayment, those individuals or that entity can support that. So to me, the UCC financings are important, but um, the primary purpose of the UCC finance statement for us are more so for uh, the intangibles, um, 
fixtures if we're fun financing uh, furniture, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, furnishing equipment or things like that, where we are doing a UCC fixture filing recording here for real estate purposes, as well as um, with the Secretary of State once we are able to assess that. Now, unfortunately, uh, some of these loans that we are reviewing, you know, that are 20 years old, a UCC was filed, which is great, but um, they, you know, we have to be sure we're on top of things and renewing them. Of course. So, uh, that's, it, it, it's not just the recording. It's actually making sure the asset yep. is still there and they haven't sold it or uh, disposed of it or the company's still a business and uh, whatever. Uh, I understand that that's, that's the chasing portion, which mm -hmm. sadly, because this was not addressed, is why it sometimes falls into a crack. And now that you're at least sending bills out, uh, it's less likely that it's going to happen. And charging late fee, again, it brings it to their attention. It, out of sight, out of mind, and shame on us for not, not being in a position. Uh, but now that we're there, I think it's fantastic. Uh, come April 1st, uh, I can only assume that every single loan has a, some form of security with it, whether it's a personal guarantee, whether it's a uh, fixture, whether it's a uh, uh, piece of machinery, I would assume that nothing went out of here without some form of security. So come April 1st, if we're going to be up to book, uh, please take that same uh, spreadsheet and actually identify where the securities are that, are, that match up with it. Mr. Chair. Yes. I think anything that's come before us, we've always had something other than a UCC filing. Oh, of course. I mean, yeah, yeah, so that's just... Well, so tough. I mean, we have to have it, yeah. due diligence, but it's really not adequate, which I'm sure you know. Well, it's, I, thought I mean, we did the depreciation on the equipment and the liens, it just doesn't make any sense. But we have to do it just to cover I thought, everything. I thought we did some with the with the peanuts and potato chip company where all we, we took just uh, just equipment, and that would have only, I thought, think that was, I think it was custom-made equipment that I thought was just, would have, yes. would have just been a UCC filing. I don't think yeah. it were. And, and in conjunction with the UCC financing statement, we put a very detailed schedule to that that specifically identified the equipment itself. Right. So we made it very clear uh, and evident that if anybody were to do a leaner title search, it, ours would It was come. ours. Yeah, we, we had and that first way it would be overlooked. So I, I thought that, as I recall, that one, yeah. 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 But primarily, but, they're mostly uh, the, the the mortgages, assignments, of leases, and rents. Yeah, mortgage obviously is the best yep. is, is the best evidence for for real estate. Uh, but I thought we had that one, was, which was just which was just some equipment. Yeah. Well, we were all eating the peanuts on the airplane. We figured that was enough. Uh, that, 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 <laughs> that was that, that was that was a good feeling on that one, as I recall. Any other questions in regards to it? Yes. I just want to say one thing uh, before uh, I get out Mr. get out of here, Mr. Chairman, is um, if I'm you. Just kind of going back, if you're going back through your heads of history of this, uh, you know, we talked a year ago about the uh, amount of effort that had to go into identifying loans. And so today uh, you asked a question about documentation. So now the edit, all the edit team did was go out and scan. So remember we talked about hard file location, electronic file location of our loans. All that was scanned and inputted. And that was one of the initial issues that both the inspector general had and the state auditor do you have your files and things in portfolio? So we've gotten that in, and so that satisfied that requirement, but now we have to go and do the forensics. So I use that word intentionally about matching up loan agreements and documents, and, and so that's the process we're in now, is going back loan by loan and going through those documents with a fine-tooth comb. So I yeah, just wanted and, to create the distinction between what happened a year ago with the edit team and identification of documents and now the validation process. And, and the learning process from this is that every loan coming through this committee in the future should be up to speed with all those things done. Uh, we should never slip backwards and, and not have the, right. the, the, you won't have to do forensics in the future because the record will speak for itself. And so it's, we have this loan checklist now that is reflected, the loan portfolio team that's in portfolio. So now there's a database that didn't exist before and portfolio is being used appropriately. So that's the level of detail and effort that's gone into correcting this. So I just wanted to make sure that people understood what well, didn't you spend all that time with edit and getting so this is the next and last phase of this. Um, well, uh, and uh, I would also say to Councilwoman Simon's uh, question, the uh, majority of loans during this administration uh, have guarantees and are secure. So those th programs, that, there were three programs that were high risk that were intentionally designed to be so, were the North Coast Opportunity uh, Program, the New Product Development Program, and then there was another next phase. And so uh, one or two of those were in the early 
tenure of this administration, and then we eliminated all of those. So everything now is routine and to the standard that you're accustomed to receiving. And I'm not adverse against the, the risk programs. Uh, I just think we should structure, if we're going to do those, those should be structured with a different kind of reward benefit. And I know we can't take equity out, but we ought to be able to take some, we, we can take out a success factor out of those things. And if we're going to be in them, then we should get a reward. The same way that when we had the folks from Jumpstart here talk about it, uh, yep. they got a reward and they, they received a benefit and, we, and uh, there's nothing that says we can't be doing that. Yeah, once we get this behind us, then I said to the executive, let's talk about how we support innovation. As you know, there's an effort underway to evaluate the stature and strength of our innovation uh, efforts collectively within the county. So we'll revisit that next year. Yep, because that's, that's, that's where the real growth takes place is, in, is innovation and new ideas and new concepts. So from that standpoint, uh, thank you, Mr. Edwards, for that. And uh, Ms. Ms. Lahoti, uh, thank you very much for your efforts behind there, too. Uh, any other questions? Hearing none, we'll adjourn the meeting and look forward to getting all the information come April 1st with everything on it.